distinct honor of launching us into a brand new series today called The Church. And I ain't even messed up about getting to preach about the church. We just finished a series uh, called Jesus. So we are in a space of just really complicated and fancy titles around here for our series. He said sarcastically, in case you're not picking up on that. But I, I believe in the church. Matter of fact, I love the church. It's his church. And we're going to talk about that over the next five weeks as we get into November. I'm pretty amped about our, our November series, too. It's called My Favorite Things. Right? Favorite things, you know, from the musical. Anyway, I ain't got time to talk about that. But I'm just saying it's going to be awesome. Uh, but when you think about the Jesus series, in week one, we were with the disciples and Jesus as they walked through a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asked his disciples a pretty pointed question. He said, first of all, who do men say that I am? Some of you are here for that. If not, maybe you're familiar with the story. It was an interesting question, not only on the basis of the question itself, but the location from which he asked it. He asked it in front of uh, some shrines to other gods. And, and he wanted to know what they said. And so they gave him a bit of a take on what people had thought about who he was. And there were pretty good answers. Elijah, one of the prophets, etc. But then he asked him an even more pointed question. But who do you say that I am? And then Peter, maybe the more gregarious, extroverted disciple, <laughs> I like Peter, though. He's, he's one of my favorites. I don't know if you're allowed to have favorites, but I do. Uh, if I get corrected, it'll be in heaven, so it's fine. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think it'll be all good. But Peter said, you're, you're the Christ. You're Jesus. You're the Christ, which meant he recognized him as the Messiah, the sent one, the once and for all sacrifice for all of our sin to, to mitigate all our suffering, even if it were in eternity. We still suffer here, but you took care of it, you're, or you will take care of it. You're Jesus, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, to launch into the series today, Jesus' retort to that. And I mentioned to you during that message <clears throat> that this is the first time in the New Testament the word ecclesia is used. It, it is a word that means church. And he said uh, to Peter, he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, which just means son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't get this on your own, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, he said, you are Peter, which incidentally meant the, the word Peter or Petros means rock. But he said, you're a Peter. And on this rock, I will build my, there you go, there you go. I'll build my church. And the, I love this too. <laughs> and the gates of hell. Hell lost another one. Come on. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now this passage has, it has a double meaning in reference to the word rock. Some would say, well, he was referring to upon this rock meaning Peter. I'm going to build my church on Peter. Uh, you know, Peter's going to live for just a short period of time after this. He's going to get martyred for the sake of the cause. But certainly he was a, a foundational. We are built, as Paul wrote in Ephesians, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And Peter's one of those foundational stones, certainly for the church today, as was Paul, even though he was prophetically writing about himself, I think. But it wasn't just Peter. It was on the truth, come on, somebody, that he spoke. The truth about who Jesus is. That's the foundation for his his church. And a first takeaway for us this morning, so here if you're new, welcome by the way. I should have said that already. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so glad you joined us today. But here at 828 Church, I'll preach for just a quick minute and then I'll give a takeaway, which is just a synoptic of what's been said so far. So here's our first takeaway. For the church to be the church, it must be built on the word and will of Jesus. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I feel like that's obvious. But we, we, I don't talk about the church, I talk about us. I'm not going to talk about somebody else. We're all part of the big C church here, all right? And we are a little C rendition of it here at 828 Church. And the series is not about 828 Church, it's about the big C church, just in case you're wondering. We'll talk about us, but, but we have to be in, intentional about building on a foundation of God's word and will. When you look at the tag for the series, if you look at the, uh, the series slide right there, Here's what we believe. We believe that the gospel, the truth about who Jesus is, that's the most synoptic version of that terminology. The truth about who Jesus is, the gospel, the fact that he is God who came to earth to give his life for us. Come on, somebody died on a cross to cover the penalty of our sin, but he didn't stay dead. I'm just saying. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the rolled away stone. 
Right? He didn't stay dead. Jesus didn't stay dead. That's the gospel. That's the truth about who Jesus is. And then there's more to it, though, than that because he instructs us on how he expects us to live. And the instruction comes to us for sure as individuals, but actually and honestly, more specifically, is the church. The church. The New Testament. The, you get past the gospels. The books of the Bible are written to the church. The family of God. And what we love to argue, you know, we do, we love to, to argue with each other, but I don't, actually, if you want the honest truth, I prefer not to, but I will if I have to, right? But we love to argue with God. Like, we, we like to debate about what is the word, what does it really say? You know, did he really say? When you, just be careful about saying that, because you'd be quoting the devil, when you say that, when you look at the word and it's obvious and then you're still saying, but does it really say that? Is that really what he meant? There was this serpent in the garden and God was pretty explicit in his instructions to Adam and Eve and he's been explicit to us as well. I don't think the things that matter most are complicated at all to discern and decide. They're right there. Just make sure you see what I'm holding. Hallelujah. They got me a bigger podium so I didn't have to lay my Bible on the floor. Appreciate it. Some of y'all like freaking out when I lay my Bible on the floor. Jesus didn't care, but some of you did. Uh, hallelujah. There it is. Right? And, but, but we like to, well, that's what the serpent said to Eve. Did he really say? And that was kind of where the disciples landed even after. So Jesus comes out of the grave, freaks them out a little bit, shows up a few times. And then they finally believe he's really the resurrected Savior of the world. Even Peter, who said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, was still struggling to actually understand and believe what that really meant, even though Jesus told them the Old Testament prophecies were clear about it, but it was still beyond comprehension. They didn't exactly believe it or understand it. So then when Jesus showed up, they're like, ah! And then, you know, but then eventually they're like, okay, that's really him. And then he spent 40 days with them. And then at the end of that, even after all of his instruction, think about John 15 and 16, where he's trying to tell them what's going to happen. You better be ready for this. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be the once and for all uh, lamb, uh, uh, the sacrifice for sin. But don't worry, I won't stay dead. Three days I'll come out. I'm going to rebuild the temple, right, church. But it's going to be different than it was before. And then when it came time, right, he's getting close to his ascension. They don't actually know this. But just before he's getting ready to go back to the Father, which he told them he would do. They ask this question, is it now time, Acts 1, 6, is it now the time that you'll restore the kingdom of God to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you, verse 7, to know the times or the seasons that are established by the will of the Father. But then in verse 8, he asked, so he said, I'm not going to answer your question because your question is flawed. But then he actually answered their question when he said in Acts 1, 8, but you, that's us. But you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my church. Okay? You will, you will be my, you'll be my witnesses. And then after saying this, right? He said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then in verse 9, he said, after this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching. And they could no longer see him. And they strained to see him rising into heaven. Then two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. And they said this, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he'll return from the heaven in the same way that you saw him go. Can you imagine it? So here they are. They're, they're still, still not quite getting it. They don't understand the assignment is about to be left to them, which I think is a questionable decision by Jesus, but who am I to question Jesus? I mean, the ascension to me seemed like a bad idea. <laughs> you should stay here with us all the time. It would be great. But he sent himself back in the power of the Holy Spirit because then he could be with all of us all the time. I'm joking. I mean, obviously it was the right idea. It's God's idea. I'm not debating it. But they were like... I don't think anybody's saying anything. They're just like, what in the world just happened? He left. <laughs> Is he coming back? no matter how much he had told them. And then the angel said, what are you doing? Get going. Get going. Now it's your turn. 
That was the birth of the New Testament church. And then they spent some time in Acts chapter 2, waiting. He told them to go wait for the power of Pentecost. Oof. And that came, everybody. Don't, don't try to do this without the Holy Spirit. Not just the Holy Spirit's indwelling, but the Holy Spirit's empowerment. We need to be fully immersed in the work and person of the Holy Spirit. We can't be who God made us to be without Him, without that. But they did some waiting. Then they did some organizing. They had to replace Judas. And they did some organizing. They got some just not only some apostles, but some deacons were starting to be put in order. There was spiritual preparation. And obviously, again, as I said, the Holy Spirit launched into that. And then in verse 42, this is a primary text for us today, all the believers devoted themselves. And what did they do? All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper which will be communion, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them. They were amazed with what God was doing in the church. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. We need to see more of that. And all the believers met together. Oh, there it is. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They brought it. They brought everything. This isn't just about money, but it is about money. But it's about your time, your talent, your treasures, everything. Everything you are, everything you have belongs to God and is meant to be invested in His church. Not just this church, but the church in the work of God in this world. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in, at the temple each day. They got into the church building more than we do. Met in homes for the Lord's Supper. Somebody give it up for life group. And shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, I'll come back to this later, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. When someone preaches about the church, the most common phrase would be to say the church is not a building. I would like to rephrase that just a little bit and say the church is more than a building. I don't want you to be all, all upset when you, know, you hear your friends say, well, I'm going to church. Okay, I don't want you to be upset about that because, strictly speaking, there is a geographical location where we come together in community, and we call it the church. That's okay. It's all right, everybody. Don't freak out. It's fine. Uh, but it's more than a building, much, much more than a building. You remember the old thing that we used to do? Let's see if I can tie-tack this mic. It was, uh, what was it? Here's the church. There's the steeple. All right. Open the door and see all the people. Yeah, remember that? Look around, that's, that's the church. This is, this is our local rendition, our part of the family. Come on, it's a family, and we're all different, and that's okay too. You know, my brother has an amazing family. His family's different than mine. We have very similar culture, but not exactly the same uh, because God's doing different things in us. It's okay to say church, but understand, because understand this, that the temple was prominent in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Did you know that the writers of the Word never edited out the conversation about the temple, the place they came together to gather? It never went away. There's a little bit of a movement, an anti-church. Oh, well, church is outside the walls. I don't have to go to church to be the church. Okay, well, there's some truth in that, but there's also some lie in that. Mm hmm a little bit of lie goes a long way, everybody. And a little bit of truth don't go very far. Now, I said it. I'll keep saying it because it's true. I'm not messed up about it. I am pro-building Sunday gathering. Here's the truth. We're called to connected Christ-following community that works together for God and good. We're called to that. We're called to that. Now, that can look a lot of different ways. That's for sure. But we are called to know him and make him known. We're certainly not called to be a social, a religious social club. If that's all we do when we come together, we should stay home. Help us, Lord. If that's what we're going to be. If it is so we can agree together on certain perspectives, political or talking points or whatever, that's what it's about. I'm not saying any of that. I think who we are in Christ should determine everything about how we decide and live in this world. So it affects all of that. But this is not that. This is the church. This is a place, this is a place where community is built for the good of God and others. Uh, and here's the truth. Church without purpose and passion isn't the church Jesus wants or wills. So we, we are called to come up in here with some purpose and some passion. So, some of you this morning might have been thinking, them people are a little bit over the top. We're not enough over the top. We're not. Well, there's not enough. Listen, you, you, if you want to judge me, 
judge me for not being passionate enough. Don't judge me at all. But if you want to think something, think that dude ought to have more passion. Because we're talking about Jesus right now, everybody. We're talking about his church. We're talking about the only thing that matters forever in this world is following God, knowing him, and making him known. And living like we do in the context of our family and our workplace and anywhere and everywhere we are, who we are. That's what we're talking about. And if that don't poke on some passion, then you need to get at this altar and do some work with Jesus. Because it's His church. He died for it. I didn't decide this. I just believed Him when He said it. I don't want to be Laodicea. Every church got flaws. Even Philadelphia, every one of them in, a, in Revelation, we look at Revelation 2 and 3, they all was some correction. We certainly have room for correction. We get a good bit of it too, hallelujah. Whew. Praise the Lord. But it's not going to be for not giving our hearts to Him. The church of Laodicea's problem was they were lukewarm and loved it. Lukewarm and loving it. They were to check the church off the list, church, and that's not what we're going to be. We are made, another takeaway, to be together in a way that honors God, prioritizes community and discipleship. Because that's what he said. He said, go make disciples. All right, well, there may be some pre-disciples sitting in the house this morning. You haven't even decided yet to follow Jesus. That's all right. You were made to follow Jesus, so I consider you a pre-disciple. All that word disciple means is follower, follower of Christ. That wherever you are right now is a good place to start following. So I ain't even messed up about it. Right? We're called or made to be together in a way that honors God. That's first. Prioritizes community and discipleship. And hear this. Expedites compelling reach. And I believe that. And there are a lot of ways we could do church. And certainly in America and Western world or whatever, there are, some, there are a lot of renditions of the church. And I wouldn't dare stand here and pick on any of them. But I will tell you why we believe in what we're doing is because that last one is what often is sacrificed for what we might like more. So we may like, you know, I'm to say this all the time. Look, I got some people that are serious about following God and raising their kids in a godly way. And if it weren't for folk being lost, broken, and going to hell, right, then I might just try to do church with them. Get me a better paying job. Hallelujah. I love what I get to do, by the way. But I'm just saying, we do this because not only does it accomplish community, right, and discipleship, it expedites reach. We believe in this large group gathering. We can bring more people in. And we can equip more people more efficiently all at one time and send them out. Hallelujah. I think it works. I believe that's what the disciples did because verse 47, I'll go back to it as I said I would, and this is what happened. When they met together, they did life together. They were consistent in the temple and in praying, come on somebody, each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Yesterday we got up in here and we laid more than a, a right at 100 prayer requests on this altar because that's what the front of the stage is. And we had prayer. Candidly, we could have used a few more prayers yesterday. Our numbers were a little low. And so we, we had to work pretty hard to pray for all those prayer requests in the time frame. So if you have some time next month, first Saturday prayer, come out. Because some of us probably prayed over 10 or 15 prayer requests in, in our groups of two or three. And, but that's what we do in community, in church. 828, I mean, the, the rendition of this church, you know, I mean, we meet in homes in the form of life groups. That's our, we do believe, by the way, there are a lot of really strong house churches. I ain't dissing on that. We do house church too. We just also do large group gathering. Hallelujah. Because we had, I don't know how many homes we're in this semester. It's a lot. Uh, there was 30 of us in my house this week. And, we, and we, we just getting started having church. But we did that because we want to, while we are growing larger, we want to make sure we maintain some intimate relationships. Uh, some of our church family meets each week under a tree in the bush. Carly and I and Carissa, who's on the keys, we went to one particular church this summer in the bush. We separated into five different churches on Sunday in western Zambia when we were there with our team. And we went to a church that's 18 years old and super strong. I would argue on a lot of levels they're probably stronger than we are, but they meet under an amazing tree in the bush. They're our family. Uh, I look forward to seeing them again someday. 
And then, of course, some churches meet in a standalone worship center. I spoke in one of those uh, or a few of those over the last year or so. Uh, and then some churches actually meet in a spot in a shopping center. <laughs> On purpose. Yeah. We turned down the standalone building because we felt like that the church needed a manifestation representation that would may, maybe be a little less intimidating to some people who didn't have a church history. I love churches with steeples and pews. I would never diss on that. I grew up in one. Our church was too poor for a steeple, but it was the kind of church that would have had a steeple had we had the money for it. Are y'all with me? As a matter of fact, the church I grew up in, I'll spend just a minute or two on that, but the church I grew up in, it was a first when I was first tiny, tiny. Uh, it was a just a white wood frame church building that didn't have a foyer. Anybody? Anybody old enough to go back that far? I mean, and those are tough to do weddings in. I did a wedding at a church like that in North Louisiana once, and the bride has to stand outside. Because <laughs> as soon as you open the door, you're in the worship center. There's no sneaking in, everybody. That's, and then, but eventually, when I was probably just in, in like maybe even preschool, they built a little foyer with bathrooms. Because before that, we had an outhouse. Yeah. And then they eventually bricked it and built a fellowship hall on the back. That's the church I grew up in. That's the church my granddad pastored. And I saw God do big work there. We, had, we were family, and not just uh, biologically, but a lot of biological family. I'll tell you how you know we were family. We had a switch tree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know some of you, you're choosing a different way to discipline your kids, and I'm not, I'm not dissing on that at all. You do what you think is right before the Lord. But we had a switch tree. Yeah, it had them skinny limbs, and it was right out there. And, and I, got, I got corrected by a lot of people. Everybody in that church had the right to do what was right with somebody's kid. And if my mama was teaching somewhere else or she was out of pocket, but I'm going to tell you the truth, and y'all going to have a hard time believing this. I'm the youngest of five, and I didn't act up, but my brother got switched a time or two, and that's all I'm saying. I'm sorry, Daryl, if you're watching. That's my, my other brother, Daryl. But the church I grew up in, it was real family. People were there for each other when life went hard. There were potlucks, <laughs> Ooh. and there was problems, and there was possibilities. It was church. And the imprint of that little country church is on this church. Everybody was welcome. If we had a weakness, it was maybe a little bit of a lack of reach. I wish we had been a bit better at reach. So I brought that with me here. There was a Rich Mullen song in a day that always reminded me of my church and my family. Because we there were five of us, and my dad wasn't a believer when I was growing up. He never went to church with us. He let some things keep him out of church. My mom would load us up in whatever ride she had, which often weren't fit for the 15-mile drive through the country to church. And <clears throat> we were rarely ever on time. My folks, they were always the last family to arrive. Seven people jammed into a car that seated five. <laughs> there was one bathroom to bathe and shave in, and six of us stood in line, hot water for only three. We all did just fine. <laughs> talk about your miracles, talk about your faith. My daddy could make things grow out of Arkansas clay. Mom could make a gourmet meal out of just cornbread and beans. <sighs> they worked to give faith hands and feet. Somehow gave it wings. Today, today is my dad's 85th birthday. Yeah, he died when he was 68, soon to be 69. He's been gone a minute. My mom persisted with him and carried him to the throne of grace. He's with Jesus. And I'm grateful. Ironically, he died on August the 28th, 828. Come on, somebody. There's, just, there's always a story behind the story. 828 is just a modern rendition of that, and we've tried to, by the grace of God, make some improvements on it. We don't have a switch tree. <clears throat> but on Monday night, the bussers lead a life group that's meeting right over here with, I don't know, a couple of dozen parents, couples, 
It's full. They lead a life group called Growing Kids God's Way. We still do that. It's important. We have kids church in a way that you can't even fathom. I mean, I think we have some photos too. If y'all could throw those up. I'm sorry, I should have said that. Uh, kids church, oof, my word. We don't have a switch tree, but we're teaching them how to live and follow God in a way that is just next level. We do, I mean, the, 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 I love the church. I love these baptisms. I love these kids' dedications. I love the way we get to come together in this altar and pray. We still do this stuff. We, it's a little hard to do potlucks because we won't fit in one service for church. You think we can have a potluck, you're being a bit naive. But we can do life big events. We had 80 people out to Federoncos for food this summer, and we'll do lots more of that. We have our own problems, but loads of possibilities. There are restoration and recovery ministries and special needs opportunities. And when someone sick, Tex is sick right now. He's one of our life group leaders. He's already had care and soup, and I'm sure he'll get some more meal trains. And, and I can say this to you, just about this church. This, isn't to, this is about the church, but I can only really speak about this church. But whatever you think about this church, you may or may not. You may wonder what we're doing and what we're not doing. I get to work with the team, and I'll tell you it's better than you think. And I don't say that pridefully. I'm just telling you, there are people in this team and in this space that just pour them, pour, pour, pour their lives out for God in ways that I'm not historically familiar with. That's his church. It's his church. Whether it's loving students on campus, whatever it is, just come on, somebody, bring it. And at the end of it, what matters most isn't what the church is. I've talked a lot about what it is, but it's about whose the church is. That's what matters most, young man. It's not what it is. It's whose it is. Because what he said in Matthew 16 and 18 was when he was talking to Peter, he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Did you see that? I'll build what? Whose church? My church. Is what Jesus said. He said, I'll build my church. Some people say to me, and I'm not upset with you, not correcting. Well, I'm correcting you, actually, but I'm not upset with you. People say, I love your church. And I tell them all the time, you can say it two ways. So I'm coaching a little bit, 828 family. You can say, I love our church. Or you can say, I love his church. It most certainly does not belong to me. And yet it does belong to me, but only as a gift from the God who actually owns it. It's our church. It's our church. God gave us this as our, it's our family. We get to do this. We're still growing and learning, and, and I, I wish that we, we could go deeper, and I hope that we will. But in the end of it, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell. You look in the world, and you're like, man, the church is in trouble. I don't know what church you're talking about, but I'm going to tell you right now, the church that follows God with purpose and passion will not be overcome. It will prevail, and the gates of hell have nothing for it. The devil is going to be doing this a lot around here. Come on, somebody. I don't know what to do. That's what the devil's going to be doing. Because it's his church. Now, if it's our church, toothless line. And probably in trouble. I still believe in the church because the church is his and Carissa is going to join me on the stage I say to you you know I think I love what Dr. Tony Evans I uh, say he's one of my favorite preachers by the way if you ever want to know some some of the people Ron listened to I'll give you one of them this is Dr. T Tony Evans I love that guy and he's got a radio voice too it don't hurt but he talks about the, the church being like God's embassy like it, it, he says that God's um, church is him putting heaven into history and when you think about an embassy, the embassy doesn't belong to the country it's in. That, even that land, that territory belongs to the, the country it's from, the kingdom, the country it's from. And it reps the values of the country it's from, not the country it's in. Y'all see me right now. Jesus himself said, in John 18, he was talking to Pilate, and Pilate said, look, I'm in charge. I mean, I, but I'm not the one that arrested you. I don't really have a beef with you. He's, pre, this is, he's about ready to be crucified, right? And 
Pilate said, I, I have the authority. They don't. They're the ones that arrested you, but I don't really have a beef with you. You know, but I can do whatever I want with you. And Jesus said, well, actually, you can't. Probably wasn't the greatest defense to stay off the cross, but he wasn't trying to do that anyway. He said, actually, if this, if my, mine were an earthly kingdom, first of all, they would have stormed a you know, a portico here. But my kingdom, he said, it's not of this world. And when he taught us to pray, what did he want us to pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will, your will be done. On earth, earth <laughs> as it is in heaven. The church is his. It's sovereign territory, everybody. That definition couldn't apply more to anything than it applies to the church. This is his space. This is the place he should be honored. He should be heard. His work and will should be done. If this is your country and he's your king, this is the church. And it supersedes every other priority, every other passion, every other perspective, every other position. I suspect I've been to the South African embassy and some others as well, but that one the most. I ran into a time of trouble or two. And I suspect that the people that are stationed at the embassy in South Africa love South Africa. It's a cool place. Don't be mad at me, but I love this world. We'll pray for Israel before we get out of here today. By the way, we will. And I love this world even in all its brokenness, but this is not my home. Just passing through. I'm not a hater. Glad to be stationed here. Hallelujah. But I have a different king. And a different, come from a different kingdom. Ephesians 2.19, Paul said, you're no longer strangers or aliens. It's just that this isn't your country. You're no longer strangers or aliens. You're fellow citizens with the saints. And members of the household of God you the church you say well I don't feel like I'm qualified come on in man it's alright no one was qualified nobody it's a gift God gave it to us I love the church come on worship team you know there's lots of things I could do to be honest with you I'm not the most gifted guy but there's lots of things I could do even in ministry before 828 when we had resigned from a church we were part of in Virginia, we loved those peeps, but we knew God was doing something different with us. And I was booked uh, whenever I wanted to be booked. And I'm not a great preacher, but I can preach pretty good once. So scheduling services out, you know, and, and going to different churches to promote the God and the gospel and to build and to speak into leadership and stuff like that and having trouble, trouble being booked. And candidly, it's, it's pretty, it, I did okay financially too. It was a blessing and I enjoyed it. And I could go to Africa as much as I wanted. And I did. <laughs> a lot. During that little bit of a gap there, as much as three months out of the year, just traveling that side and coming back even. And, and loved it. But it, it just wasn't enough. There wasn't enough impact. It looked good on paper, but there just wasn't. I believe in the church. I love the church. The gospel is the hope of the world, and the church is the hope of the gospel. And I wanted to build his church. And he said, start from scratch. I said, I have history. People who will hire me. He said, I don't care. I said, okay. And I'm so thankful. I was in uh, South Africa recently for an association-related church conference in Torn Wells. Who, we do some of his songs around here. He was a speaker. And he has a message he started preaching about six months ago called I Love the Church. And in it, he was just talking about how this last year, and I got to hang out with him a little, which was cool. He is who he seems to be, super guy. I messaged him last night, actually, and he hit me back. 
examples. Listen, I'm going to probably tell the story imperfectly. If you want an option to give any uh, corrections, do it now. He didn't. But he showed a picture on the stage. They're getting ready to launch a church. He sells out concert venues all over the world. He doesn't lack for any dough or something amazing to do. But he's planting a church. And he's going to sing, do what you're famous for in worship. And it'll be the guy that wrote it and sang it. So it'll be cool. But he showed a picture of baptizing a lady. She didn't look like him. She didn't have the same skin color as him. He baptized her and she was coming out of the water with her fists up high. And he said, with a lump in his throat, that's my favorite thing I've gotten to do so far this year. I love the church. And the God who gave it to us, I believe, being deeply involved in a church that loves God and pursues His purposes is the best thing I can do for my family and the most impactful thing I can do with my life. A poem, I love the church, not for what it isn't, but for what it is. I love the church. I know it isn't perfect, but I love it because it's His. It's not the people. It's not the steeple, it's the people, not the cushioned seat or pew. Jesus died to build his church. And when he did, he thought of you. He thought of family for his children, a place to live despite the fall, where his kingdom would be honored and then shared outside the walls. May we with passion make a space so those in need can find his best. Though when we serve and sow together, we're the ones who are most blessed. I love the church. Thank you, Jesus, for gifting us with your church. Even now in this house today, there are needs for sure. Maybe someone has been hurt and found themselves a distance from the family or the church. I pray for healing. I pray for a decision to lean in again and to trust and to be a part. Maybe someone's here, God, with just heaviness or heartache or brokenness or a, an addiction or a battle with habitual sin, whatever it is, this is the place, this is the space you made for us to come together and find you, to find freedom.